Good afternoon, everyone. Our speaker for this session will talk about how to keep a secret. Let us all welcome Gleb Leskovic. Hi, everybody. I'm Glyph, and today I'm going to be talking about how you can keep secrets in your Python code and beyond. Secret management is a huge topic, and we've only got 30 minutes here, so before I get started, I want to lay out my specific goal. I will talk about how to store sensitive information on your computer. Mostly, I want to talk about how to do this as an author of software that expects you to be dealing with secrets. However, in order to talk about that, I also need to talk about how users are going to be behave in order to get the most out of the thought you put in that process. I think it's also useful to talk about what areas of security I'm not going to be talking about. I'm not going to be talking about secure messaging apps. This is not about how to share a secret with another human. A secret is something you don't share. I'm not going to talk about HTTPS or certificates. You might be able to use these techniques that I'm talking about today to store your secret keys a little bit better, but that's good too. So the kind of secret that I want to focus on is one that is not meaningful to a human being. Things like passwords or cryptographic keys. They're short and therefore they don't require significant storage. Uh, I'm not talking about encrypting large amounts of data. In order to do that, you need somewhere to store the key that is doing the encryption, so you need to know what to do with these short secrets on your own. Talking about security properties on their own terms can be a little bit dry. Uh, a narrative with characters and motivations can raise the level of interest, make it a little easier to keep track of uh, what's going on. So I'm going to introduce a character to you. Say hello to Jethro. Jethro is the main character of our story today. However, since this is an educational story, it's more like a modern fable. And historical fables use talking anthropomorphic animals to teach their lessons. But modern fables that need to have their main character in a grim lesson about the world instead incorporate a familiar plot point, a time loop. In all good time loop stories, the moral may be somewhat obscure at first, but its true nature will be revealed as our protagonist struggles to understand their situation. They will be released from its relentless repetition only when they have learned the lesson. So, okay, if you saw the words content warning come up on the slide and some of you got a little nervous, don't worry, there's nothing offensive coming up. But I do want to point out something about this story that applies to all in-depth information security work. It might legitimately make you anxious. You might hear things that you're doing and then some horrible kind of breach or consequence for users or company that could follow from that. Thinking about that over and over again can really start to take a toll on you. To some extent, being a security engineer involves being a professional catastrophist. You have to keep thinking of the same worst possible thing that could ever happen in detail over and over again. So it's important to note and to emphasize that the attack scenarios I'm describing are rare and in many cases would require quite extreme effort on, uh, and resources on the part of the attacker. There are also lots of people who are working to defend you against these attacks. Your operating system vendor, open source package maintainers, the PyPI admins, they're all constantly trying to help defend you. There are attacks across a whole range of vulnerabilities, and secret storage is really only one of them. For one example, I'm going to talk about typo squatting, the practice of attackers registering malicious packages on PyPI. Such attacks are possible, and they do happen regularly, but even if you're completely careless with your pick installs, the PyPI admins are routinely being notified of such packages and actively moving. And that's just one defense among several against this unfortunate attack vector. Now they're perfect, but they're all helping. So with that caution out of the way, hopefully we're all feeling nice and calm, and we're in a happy place. Time for the nightmare fuel. All right. Jethro has an idea for a billion dollar company. Blue for you. It's an API that can compute a unique blue that nobody else is using yet uh, for their company or project branding. The idea here is that it's going to be an open core offering. Blue for you is open source. You can self-host it if you want, but the enterprise version, purple for professionals, can also generate purples. That's the value there. Also, as a brief aside, speaking of combinations of warm and cool colors, uh, some of our fellow trans pythonistas might have had difficulty attending this year due to unfortunate recent political developments at our venue. Those developments affect those who live here even more. I don't have much time to say more, but uh, I'm going to be matching your first $20 worth of donations to a local Utah LGBTQ plus charity. You can circle together, find me after the talk, or send your receipts to encircle at bliss.im and let me know if you'd like to send your Back to the topic. What I'm going to do here is called threat modeling in the information security industry. We will be enumerating threats, 
uh, and compromise. Each time loop, we will try to confront a set of threats and defend against them. So let's begin. It is the morning of February 2nd. Jethro wakes up. Jethro creates a Git repo, he makes a little website, starts testing it. It's great. Processing all kinds of requests for new kinds of blue on his laptop. He's getting buzz from the press, he's on all the Python podcasts, this is going to be a revolution in the open source blue community. But of course, it's no use for his planned paywall professional purples if it's just sitting on his laptop. So he makes an account at his cloud provider. Jethro's a busy guy, he doesn't have time to memorize some complicated new password, and so he just uses the same email and, and password that he used for his LinkedIn account. Now, with the benefit of the narrator's eye view of this story that Jethro doesn't have, I suspect many of you can already see where this is going. Attackers hear about Jethro's cool new website, cross-reference it with a few password dumps from past data breaches, and voila, they've taken over his entire cloud account. They boot a million servers, they mine cryptocurrency, blue for you is instantly bankrupt, all his blues lost. And now, it's the morning of February 2nd. Jethro wakes up. If you don't already have a password manager, you need to get one right now. There is often a trade-off between convenience and security, but in the case of a password manager, you actually get both. Uh, I highly recommend 1Password, which is free to anyone working on an open source project, but uh, there's probably one built into your web browser, too, and that's fine. So Jethro does that. He gets a password manager, generates a new, good, highly secure random password. Then he immediately forgets that password and loses access to everything. He goes to reset it and is unpleasantly surprised to learn that the inability to reset that one password is where the rest of the security comes from. So it's impossible. He loses access, who for you is now bankrupt again. It's the morning of February 2nd. Jeffrey wakes up. Now, Story Secrets isn't just being about being a super spy and using cool encryption tech. It's also about backups and reliability. So now I'd like to talk about uh, something called the CIA trial. Now, I realize many of you may already have a strong association with the acronym CIA in the context of security, but no, it is not about the Culinary Institute of America's practices in safeguarding its recipes. What the letters actually stand for in this case are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality is the fun part, where you keep stuff secret with encryption and firewalls and stuff. But the other two letters are important, and if you don't have them, you don't actually have security. The I for integrity refers to the fact that you can't let attackers change your data. This isn't super relevant to this talk because modifying a random piece of data like a password or an API key is pretty cool thing for reading it. So that leads to the one that is important, which is availability. Your system is available if you can use it. In the case of your secret management system, that means it's unavailable if you forget the master password. So make careful plans to remember it. I've actually got a little tool that can help you generate and remember those core passwords that you've actually got to remember in your brain with your phone pin and your master password called PinPal. It's a little rough, it's command line only at this point, but not much to grab. So it's February 2nd once again. Jethro's more careful to memorize his master password this time. Puts all his website passwords into it. Right. After he set up that cloud account, he gets an email explaining that he needs to do a security check. So he clicks the link and tries to log in. Now, for some reason, his shiny new password manager isn't autofilling like he expected, so he figures it's a bug. Once again, the benefit of the narrator's eye view, uh, being outside Jethro's universe, you can probably see where this is going, but he doesn't. He opens up his password manager app, copies the username and password manually, and pastes it into the website. It's the morning of February 2nd. Jethro wakes up. The website in question was, in fact, not his cloud provider's security website. It was a phishing attempt. Now, a million security websites will get to this point in their narrative and tell you that you should never click on links in emails. This is terrible advice. It's 2023. All our jobs are like 75% clicking on links in emails. The other 25% are just like idling on Zoom. So we just hope we don't get hacked, right? Password managers actually have a really neat feature that can help you here. They will only autofill your password on the correct site. So don't override all. If you ever find yourself in Jethro's situation, where the password's not autofilling, which can often happen, many companies have many different domain names and you might need to use the same password on all 47 Microsoft's login sites. Um, what you should do is open up the password manager, find the entry for the password in question, and manually type the URL of the correct site you're trying to log into. Do not copy it, as the attacker's URL might be quite convincing. Just type it into the website field by hand, and if it still doesn't match, then maybe consider getting some help or some friends to look at the mail to make sure it's legit. Even better than the password manager, 
alone is a hard token that uses web authentication. It's effectively physically impossible to use with your own website. There are a few other cool things you can do with these keys. That's for sure. So Jethro learned his lesson. He gets a password manager. He generates and memorizes the Chrome bomb password. Jethro's ready. Time for code. He gets his repo set up, starts hacking on some code, gets the development kit from his cloud provider, and tries to boot the server with the Python API. But the cloud SDK can't read his web browser's mind, so it can't authenticate. He looks in the docs for authentication, and the examples from his provider all just show the secret being pasted into the code. So he logs onto the site, grabs the API key off the security page, sticks it into his code, and pastes it. Okay, now it's time to start coding. Booting the server works. Push some code up there to free. The site's live. Blue for you is in business. Great, time to push that code. Wait, wait a sec. The secret's just still sitting there in the source file. And this repo is open source. This is an open port project. Jethro realizes his mistake only a minute later, but as he's struggling to figure out the right series of arcane Git commands to rewrite history and purge a GitHub repository, automated scrapers already have the key. The cryptocurrency miners are off the races. It's the morning of February 2nd. Jethro wakes up. Some of you might be saying, come on, Jeff. I know we're suspending disbelief here thanks to the poignant emotional narrative that you're so skillfully weaving. Thank you, by the way. I don't to say. But that's just silly. I've made a server on AWS. I know they don't just tell you to put your API key in your source code. And you're half right, dear listener. It is very silly. But unfortunately, it's actually quite common. Now, I don't want to pick on these providers specifically because this is pervasive. But just to show that big, serious companies with very good security in general do this, it's a brief call of shock. Stripe Python SDK gives an example where they literally just show some Python code with the API key pasted in the middle of it without any caution this might be an issue. DigitalOcean's API documentation shows an export command. It implies you should be putting your API key into your shell startup. Again, no caution. Unless the Python shows this, since it's such a Ruby thing, the Python documentation is exactly the same. The officially recommended Python API for Zendesk begins with an example that features every type of credential. Why not toss your password in there, too, as long as we're putting things in source code? So, a little bit of a personal digression here. I have a five-year-old kid, and they got to come see me give another talk at a different Python conference a little while ago. They didn't get a ton out of the talk itself, given it was about MyPy and how to use higher level features to make model and dynamic code more type checkable. However, one side slide stuck out, and it specifically asked me to include it in this talk because it was, in their words, the funniest joke. This is a good spot to use that slide to express how I feel about docs that set up beginners to use secrets and source files. So, you know, this one's for you. This is why I was motivated to give this talk in the first place. If you were interested enough to attend this talk, you probably already know better than this, but for developers starting out, they are going to see and copy the exam. Authenticating to your service is literally the first thing that they will ever do with it. They, by definition, do not have other tools to rely on. This is why, if you're going to write documentation like that, this talk is for you. At the end of this talk, if you're bored because you already knew all the technical content, great, your users don't. They're going to follow your direction. Don't tell users to paste API keys into their code. So, okay, hopefully I've convinced you. But what should you do instead? Well, we're in the middle of a fable, and typically you find the lesson at the end of the fable, so let's rejoin our story. Where were we? All right. Take a second. Jethro wakes up. So Jethro knows he needs to try some different stuff. Let's see what he does. He sticks the secret into his Dropbox folder instead. But then he fat fingers a paste of a share link in a blog post one day. Now it's public. It's there to be said. He tries to put in his code again, but with a git ignore this time, it's a special file that doesn't get checked in. Later, he like accidentally hits enter while his editor has the git ignore file focused. And before tabbing over to another file, another git connect dash am pushes it. It's there to be said. Then he tries using his dash RC in an environment variable and reads it from OS.environment. Unfortunately, in the process of submitting a bug report for an open source library, a put your logs in the gist tool dumps the output of the end command into a public gist. It's February 2nd. Okay, so this is the tutorial more carefully this time. Later on, after they have the thing about the source code, they suggest putting it in a dedicated config file. So he does. And to be honest, you might be able to get away with this. Private files on your personal hard disk are, after all, somewhat private. If you can't trust that a little bit, then you're going to have a hard time doing anything private. But we can do a little bit better. 
more importantly, Jethro, unlike us, lives in a universe ruled by a capricious God who is intent on him learning only one very specific lesson. So bad things are going to keep happening to him. For example, Jethro uses a backup service to back up his laptop, and his backup provider gets breached. Since the file's plain text, the attackers grab it out of the backup. Jethro wakes up, stay for a second. Jethro tries to put his backup on a hard disk instead, but then the hard disk gets stolen. Attackers read it. Jethro wakes up. This time, Jethro decides he doesn't need any backups, but he chains the laptop to his wrist. But remember availability? There's a power surge. His laptop disk fails. Attackers don't get their cryptocurrency, but he still loses everything. It's February 2nd. Jethro wakes up. Jethro enables full disk encryption in his OS. He encrypts the backup drives too, so he's not Now he's got backups, and they're encrypted, and his disk is encrypted. Good stuff. He's really starting to get serious now. He looks into the best way to actually store his secrets on purpose, and he starts using the keyring function for logging. Jethro uses macOS for development, so he goes into the system keychain, which is encrypted and secure. Great. I should really em- emphasize this. If you learn anything from this talk, it's really just use the keyring function. Keyring straightforward. We will be exploring more of Jethro's mistakes in a moment, and that will give us the opportunity to explore its advanced features. But in code that just uses secrets, this is really all you need to do. Call set password to save something called get password to get it back. Any application that has done this is instantly more secure. Gives you a couple things by default. Keyring defaults to using the operating system's credential store which means that you get all the collective wisdom of your operating system's vendors, ideas about what threats are salient to defend against, and what the best ways to deal with those threats are. Even if it doesn't actually provide better security for your case, it also means that when either you or your users go to review what sensitive information is available on their computer, they can use standard interfaces for this stuff on their operating system. Keyring supports multiple backends, which means that users with different needs can configure applications using keyring to pull secrets from more secure places if they do need that. Just use keyring is the 80 in the 80-20 of this talk, but as you may recall, Jethro's life is ruled by a malevolent force whose only interest is better information security, so he's going to have to contend with some slightly more esoteric things. The next one is something you might want to think about, but keep in mind that we're starting to get in more advanced territory. Everything we've done so far assumes that Jethro's computer itself is following his instructions. But what happens when some evil software wants to steal his secrets and it's already running on his computer? Now, Jethro's not going to any evil dark web hacker websites, but he does install, install cool new PyPI package every so often. PyPI are software that runs on your computer as your user with access to all of your files. IPI does not have any way of scanning every single new piece of software for malicious code on that. So you have to be careful about what you're, what you're installing. And one day, Jethro tries to pip install pandas. But in, instead, he accidentally does pip install padmas instead. And unfortunately, in Jethro's universe, IPI's admins are just a little bit less quick to remove malware in response to reports. So this actually belongs to an attacker there. It's the morning of February 2nd. Jethro wakes up. On every platform, by default, Keyring grants access to secrets automatically because that's what the platform credential stores do. We can request stuff in the background without you noticing. This time, Jethro reads Keyring's documentation very carefully and sees there's a security note about macOS where you can get prompted every time a specific secret is used. When the type of squatting mistake inevitably happens again, Jethro's ready and gets a prompt to enter his login password. He realizes what's happening, he hits deny, deletes the bad package. Unfortunately, uh, if you recognize this it's case uh, on every other platform, Keyring grants access to pretty much any software that's running on your computer because Windows and Linux don't have meaningful entry user security guidance. And Jethro's co-founder uses Windows, uh, so same story again, Jethro wakes up. At this point, Jethro writes a piece of software to try to address this problem. Keyring supports custom backends which can be specified by users even if the applications don't know about them specifically. So Jethro can control what happens when secure Python code looks for a secret. Specifically, Jethro's new backend will prevent secrets from being accessed even by malware without his knowledge. WebAuthn has a specific terminology for this. It's called a user presence check. It's why, if you use a token authenticator, you need to both plug it in and physically touch it to log in. And that's what Jethro wants for his extra sensitive secrets here. 
as I mentioned earlier, this sort of hard token uh, that you can use to perform web authentication authentication on the website is a great security option. So Jeff already had one that got his uh, password protected. You wouldn't necessarily want to use this for every kind of secret, but some secrets are more powerful than others and should be protected more aggressively. Some secrets can do stuff like sync your email in the background, and you need them to have easy access because you wouldn't want to have to touch your hardware key every two minutes. If you're doing it constantly, you won't notice when something unexpected happens because the touch prompt would always be expected. So Jethro writes a piece of software, a custom keyring backend that uses a part of the hard token protocol to encrypt each secret as a Fernet token, making it impossible for his secret to be discovered unless this token is plugged in and he touches it. Since it's a keyring of tokens, he calls it token ring. Sorry, dude, I said this joke in the it's not copyright infringement if it comes from a parallel universe, so I grabbed this software from this iteration of the time loop before Jethro got reset back to the beginning. Uh, and since I've spent so much time being the fickle god ruining someone else's life, I didn't want to give the demo gods the opportunity to do the same for me. So this isn't a live demo, but it is from a couple hours ago. After stealing Jethro's code uh, and resetting his universe, this is a quick recording of me releasing it on PyPI at this point. Note that I'm using Token Ring to release Token Ring uh, in just a second. So when the package finish bu finishes building, I use Klein, which is the standard uploader for PyPI packages, and it prompts for a touch because it's using that keyring backup. So if you have some high security application which you'd like to secure above and beyond your password manager, you can tip install token ring and feel free to use that solution. Now, Jeffrey is in a pretty good place at this point. This is an extremely difficult approach to secrets management. The most sensitive secrets he's storing on his laptop are incredibly secure, only accessible when his hardware key is plugged in. Every access requires user interaction. But Jeffrey's attackers are not our attackers. They have access to advanced scaling technology. They now deploy a zero foot zero day against his laptop. They wait until he touches the view key to steal his secret out of memory. It's the morning for their secrets. Jeffrey wakes up. At this point, he loses it. He's going to protect his secrets at any cost. He raises $100 million in venture funding. He hires a team of thousand security engineers. They call over every aspect of the possible uses of secrets that he might ever have. They air gap all of their systems. Unfortunately, in all this endless security hardening, he forgets to ever actually create an application. Remember the application? They run out of money and the company shuts down, never having generated even a single blue, let alone a purple, for a customer. It's the morning of February 2nd. Plot twist! Did you think the lesson was just about being infinitely careful about your secrets? Jethro wakes up and thinks long and hard about what he's been doing wrong. He realizes that he's just been reacting to each new attack, one at a time, always fighting the last one. There's no way that he can out-resource these attackers. They appear to be almost demonic in their power and influence. So instead, he makes a list and a budget. He reviews the basics for himself. He uses the password manager. Encrypt the disk. He can encrypt the backups. Use the keyring module. Configure a backend appropriate to the sensitivity of the data. He makes a plan for all these attacks. He can write it down and tell his co-founder about it. He trains any new employees or contributors that need to interact with these secrets as well. When the attackers break in again, he knows how. Jethro contacts his provider and shows them his documented security procedures. They agree that he's gone above and beyond. They restore his service and give him a refund. The attackers nuke his machine with ransomware, but he's got up to date backup. It's still his laptop, but it's encrypted. It's the morning of April 26th. Jethro wakes up. The attackers have given up. For now, Jethro's at PyCon. He's got a boot that started right. The blue for you and purple for pros websites are online, generating colors and memory. He lives under the ground. In this talk, which, as you've seen, is already long enough that it barely fits into this time slot, I've only been able to review how Jethro secured his secrets on one computer, his laptop. You'll also need to deal with secrets in the cloud. Another important rule that I didn't have time to cover here is that you should limit the power, scope, and lifetime of your secrets. Make them less powerful than you can. You still eventually need to store them somewhere. You still will always have some powerful secret, but it doesn't have to be always access all the time. There are quite a few tools that you can use to create short-lived API tokens. They're inherently specific in service you're using them, which is why it's hard to give a talk about the general concept. Um, several exist for AWS, though, which is certainly one of the higher uh, privileged things that you're likely to deal with. Uh, 
two popular ones, you can check out are Gimme AWS Creds and AWS Creds. You also need to put secrets into your CI systems and cloud servers. The providers have APIs for this, and in particular, you probably want to know about GitHub Actions dedicated uh, secrets management tool. Uh, there's also a Python library called HVAC, which is sort of a keyring for the cloud. Uh, it's a client for the HashiCorp Vault service, which can extract all the backend secret sharing services for various cloud systems. Note also that if your application is already using keyring, then when you start integrating with tools like this, you can change the keyring backend on the different deployment scenarios that you're using. So for basic secrets access, you only need to config or change your configuration, not your code. Thank you very much for coming to my talk and happy secrets with So uh, I'm Glyph. You can find me on the internet. I type Glyph in various places. Um, we only have a couple minutes left. We might have time for one question, but uh, I think most of the questions are going to be in the long side. Uh, so thanks again.